ranging from chemical engineering and consulting to product and project management. He has focused his efforts on product management and chemical management solutions. He earned his BE in chemical engineering from the University of Mumbai and his MS in engineering management from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Abhishek. Hey, thank you, Ed, uh, for the introduction. So let's get started on when logic takes over, smart chemical approval. So what's on the an agenda today is um, we go over the introduction for chemical approval. We talk about the information that we need. How do we capture that information and data? How does where and how does the data flow? And then why do we need to control the process? All right, so what is chemical approval? So it's basically a, a process. An approval is nothing but a plain, good old, simple process. It can be uh, as simple as a bunch of steps that you follow in your organization to approve uh, material. Um, there are organizations who still use paper. It's a form which is moved around within an organization, or it is, or it is uh, an email which flows around through a series of people before a material can be uh, brought on site. But, but that is not the most efficient way to do this because there is a need for a very robust and a very streamlined approval process uh, in the industry. There, the industry is always changing. It is evolving, businesses are changing and evolving, so there's always a need for that. So what we need to do is, is to have a very streamlined chemical approval process. So let's, let's talk about, when we talk about process, let's just start with um, an example. Let's talk about Captain Charlie uh, Plant. He's a Vietnam uh, veteran. He flew missions over Vietnam. He flew off uh, USS Kitty Hawk. One of those missions, when he was flying over Vietnam, he was shot down, he was captured, and then at the end of the war, he was able to return back home. One day, he and his wife were out having uh, dinner, and this man comes up to him and he says, hey, you're Charlie Plum. You flew missions over Vietnam and you got shot down. Um, and, and that time, Captain Charlie Plum said, hey, how do you know me? The guy says, well, I, I packed your parachute. Charlie Plum at that point thanked him and said, hey, if you, it, because of you, I'm here today having dinner with my wife. Now, what's, what's the significance of the story? It, it's, it's a really good story. It, it's an awesome story, but what's the significance, underlying significance? It's the process. There was a process that was set up on how a parachute is packed, is checked. It was done by somebody who's an expert. There was a process where the pilot had to carry his parachute, and then when, in an event when he was shot down, there was a process on how to open the parachute correctly, and that saved his life. So this, this process that, that was created which saved his life can be applied in our organization when, when, you, have, um, when you have to approve a chemical uh, which comes on board. So let's talk about the chemical approval and let's talk about some of the uh, evaluation criteria that you require when it comes to um, getting an approval on site. So every chemical has to be, appro has to be um, approved, but going through an approval process, it requires to consider certain criteria. You have your business requirement, um, so what we'll do is we go to one, each, each one of these, or for most part, we go through most of these. So one of the biggest things is the business requirement. It all depends on what does your business do? Does, what area of industry is your business in? Are you in manufacturing? Are you in um, healthcare? Are you, um, are you actually in uh, construction? You have multiple um, areas. So you have your business requirements that drive your approval process. You need to look at what your business does and then, and then that easily flows into your legal requirements and regulations. You need to understand where, 
what you do as a business, how does it impact uh, the legal aspect? What is the legal impact of that uh, whole business? Do you need to cater to something? Do you need to consider some legal uh, information? Then you have your regulations. Do you need to worry about what regulations are you, is, is your industry subjected to? Is there any downstream effect which can impact certain other regulations? You need to consider all of these factors to be, in, to be included when you're actually capturing information about a chemical that you plan to bring on site and use in your facility or your end product or your, um, you know, or, or just the store on site. You have, and then you have to, of course, consider the safety requirements because you need to consider what is the implication to your uh, employees. You need to consider what is the implication if it's an end-use product to your consumers. Uh, you need to consider the environmental health and safety aspect to it, wherein you need to figure out, hey, so if this material is on site, if it can be stored for a certain amount of time, what's the impact? Or let's say, for example, if you uh, have used you use a material as a filler and then you are disposing of it, what, how does it impact the environment? How does it impact the health and safety of my employees or my end users? Now, all of these are used basically to consider, you have to consider data points for, for these criteria to be used in your chemical when you're proving them. Product stewardship and green chemistry. Product stewardship is a very broad, broad subject. Um, there are a lot of aspects to product stewardship, but what we want to talk about in from, in, from a chemical approval standpoint is product stewardship, you need to know what's going on with your chemical. You need to know the effects, you need to know the impact, and that will make you, that gives you data to drive what your product, where it goes, what is the impact of your product on a broader, broader uh, scale. So you need to focus on that. Green chemistry. Clean chemistry is pretty much um, the, the new changes in regulations, constant change in regulation, all the environmental concerns that we have nowadays. You people are moving towards using chemicals which are which have a much better impact on environment, or it reduces the impact on environment. You're trying and pushing towards getting to a greener uh, chemistry using alternative materials to what you're currently using. To do so, you need certain data set. You need to know what, what is coming on site now, how it has been used, and you don't get that information directly from your chemical approval, but you have in a baseline data that you collect, and this baseline data can be used to look for alternatives and use them. So that's one of the criteria you would want to consider when you're bringing a chemical on site. Uh, so let's talk about to do a chemical approval, what what do you need? You need what you need in the beginning is data. Data is your key. That's your driver. Now, where does the data come from? Most of most of us use this data from leverage data from the SDS, but there are other data sources that you need to consider. And we we go over it in a bit. But data is your key when it comes to your chemical approval. The next thing you you need to know what we need to know or what is what should be a very good practice is how is it capture like key to capturing a data this data is 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 important because you can you can have a lot of data but you don't need all the data that's available within your chemical chemical you just need to capture certain data points next thing we want to know is who is how does the data need to flow through your organization who needs to see that data? Does that data need to be cross-referenced against something? Do you need to understand how the data interacts with another set of data to give you uh, more accurate information? So what happens? And then we talk about what usually happens at the end of an approval or a denial. So, so next thing, let's, let's, now let's go deep dive into each of this, uh, these topics. Let's, let's talk about what data is needed. So, as I said, your data drives the process. It is the key key information. Uh, it it can range from anything. So I'm not here today trying to tell you about what is the ideal way to capture ideal data to capture. I can give you some recommendation of how you should capture. There be some I can I can give you some maybe the best practices, but I cannot tell you what data 
needs to be captured. Here's, and here's why I can't tell you that. is because each industry is different. Each organization is different. Each approval process within an organization is different. What, even within one facility within an organization can have more than one process to capture data because it could it could work on multiple product lines, it could work on multiple processes in one facility, and you would have a different workflow. So like I said, so let's now let's go back to where do we where do we at least start capturing this data? Do we we just can't create this data out of our thin air. So you start pretty much with the safety data sheet. So you start with the SDS because every chemical that's coming is S is, comes with an SDS, or it should come with an SDS. A lot of times you don't, and you have to actually reach out to your manufacturer or supplier and uh, gather the SDS. So SDS gives you a very good understanding of what, what the chemical is about. Now, when, when you're requesting something, you some, most people don't, the, not, not everybody goes through the SDS in detail. It's more about letting your uh, SMEs uh, go through the SDS and the associated data and approve and approve it. But SDS is a really key starting point. Now, now let's look at an example. Uh, let me just walk you through a quick example is um, sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate it can be ingested. Sodium bicarbonate can be used uh, orally. Sodium bicarbonate can be used uh, as a cleaning agent. But here's the thing, it's a different use. It'll be the same SDS. But the data that you need for this process to work, um, to be approved, you need a different set of data for each of this, uh, in, for this material to be brought on site. So let's talk about, okay, I'm, I'm gonna actually, so let's talk about this uh, data in terms of what additional data sources do you need? Do you need, Sometimes you have your sodium, you have your sodium bicarbonate, which is used, but then suddenly you need a certain specific uh, concentration of sodium bicarbonate. You need to capture that data. And that data usually comes from full disclosure or supply information or supplementary documentation. And you have to capture, now here's the thing. Now I'm talking about all of these data points and it's a lot of repeated word of data. And what I've just said has a lot of information and I'm not even scratched the surface because there is a whole lot of information that is available even outside some of these, uh, you know, points. What you need is to, now how do you filter through all of this data and to figure out what you need to capture? You have to have a great understanding of what your process is, what your material, what it does, and you need to have a clear cut plan on how, how the material is used. So. You collect all of this data, and this is a, a huge amount of data. So let's just, before we go on forward, let's just start uh, with a poll. And um, so we, how, so the question is, how do you capture the data you need to make decisions? Paper form, homegrown system, software application, ERP, no system, or others? Um, so, so you see, these are some of the ways that you do capture your data, uh, key information. Um, we've seen a lot of people use a homegrown system, but we are not even sure uh, it meets all the needs. There's been a lot of changes in regulation, a lot of changes in things that needs to be considered nowadays. Uh, what we used to consider as uh, things that were okay, but now we have to focus on more of the unique uh, needs as evolution has happened in the chemical world. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of interested to know what, how do you guys capture your data at this point? Like, what is what is the most common thing? Is it a big giant ERP? Is it is one of those homegrown systems? Yeah. All right, so it seems 
everybody uses up. Most of the people out here use a, use a software application and a homegrown system that is interesting, but there's still a 14, there's a still a 14% of you use a paper form. That is very interesting to hear. Um, all right, so we talked about capturing data points and information. So let's talk about what, what we, what we would recommend is probably one of the best, uh, easier or the most recommended way to capture information. Forms. Forms is probably the best way to capture information. You can create your own questions. You can create uh, your, it's almost like a story. You can write your entire story that you want your users to, to write out about the chemical they're getting on site. So forms is the best way to capture data. So before we jump into smart forms, let let me talk to talk to you guys about some of the forms that I have seen being created. Uh, usually, people tend to create a huge long form. Uh, they throw in almost every possible question there is that they can think of. It is a uh, huge, cum cumbersome form. People have questions after questions. Some of them run into 100, 160 questions. Now, does it give you the information? Yeah, it does. But does everybody, does every material have that relevant information? Do we need to uh, even capture that much information? It, the most, for most part, the answer to those questions is no. Um, and given today's space as how things move quickly, you need relevant, you need targeted information to capture for your material. Your SMEs, your reviewers, people who actually evaluate your chemical and the information that is directed towards the chemical, that's not their day job. They have other responsibilities, and this is one component of, of that. So how do you make their uh, work easier? How do we do this? So I know a lot of you said you have a software application or ERP. The question is, is it one of those smart, uh, does it provide you smart logic? Does it give you logic to put in your application? I know an ERP uh, software would make your life easier because you already can go, you can fill in information and then you know it goes through a process. Does it allow you to create smart forms? And, and I say create, because if you are, if, if we have to create a form, like if you have a, a software which creates a basic form, we don't know what your logic is. Because if, like I said, every organization is unique. So what you need is the, is the ability to create smart forms. So, what you have to do is when you create the gigantic form of yours, you can put in your conditions, you can put in your logic statements. And what it does is when your users go in and they fill out information, they hit a specific question. That specific question then triggers another set of questions. So they don't need to see, let's say you have a form where you want uh, somebody, you ask a question if this material has to go to the environmental health and safety uh, for review when they make that choice, it actually opens up into that seg segment. You don't inundate your users with redundant information gathering. You don't stop the process where they have to go away from the computer, look for information from 100 sources, come back, fill it out. Instead of slowing down your process, you're actually streamlining it. The other benefits are your data that you're uh, capturing is is to reduce error. Now you don't have confusing data for your reviewers or your SMEs who are evaluating. And we already talked about users not being overwhelmed. You, users' focus can be directed to provide data which has most impact on the organization. So again, like your data isn't irrelevant to the process. So let's talk about some of the smart forms, what, what we have, what we've seen in the market, right? We, so if you see this example, this is uh, sodium bicarbonate that was being brought on site. Uh, there was a question where it, which said, where was the chemical used for? They clicked on medical and it opened up the section which showed them all the questions that's relevant 
for the use of uh, why, what use it is for um, the medical. So how was it used? I mean, I think the question out here, what is the state of the material? It was, it was, the act, it was an active or inactive uh, ingredient? So these are questions that are relevant to uh, a medical uh, department. A lab, that, that might not be the same relevant question. It, the lab has a separate set of questions out there. So if you see, the lab's asking about what ventilation is required. Now, again, th this is just an example of a form. Um, in, again, it, it varies from where the, sodium, the material or sodium bicarbonate is used. So you need, and one of the other thing is in the smart forms, um, try and keep your questions and your triggers small. So that's one of the other recommendations is to keep your questions and triggers small so that you have control over them. With smart forms, you should always use um, your questions to be, you should use your, 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 okay, let me just rephrase. So the question that you should have for your smart forms, it should be more driven off of checkboxes, drop downs, or radio buttons. Now, why do I say that? The reason I say that is it goes back to A, when your users are actually looking at it, they, can see the information easily. They have a finite amount of choices and they know what information you want. So creating a smart form is the, is the hard part because you need, to, you need to know your process inside out. You need to define your process. It has to be well planned. But when, and for your user, it should be just choices. So when you are looking at all of the information uh, or the, your users are looking at it, for them, it's easy. They can just check out things, and they don't have to think too much, and they know exactly what they are answering. What is the what is the advantage to the other side? Like, what's the advantage to people who are actually reviewing that information, or even for an admin? The advantage is very simple. Your data is streamlined. It is fine. It is a fixed data set. So when you're running a report, or when you're looking evaluating the data, you can compare against a standardized set of data instead of having Let's say you have a lot of text box questions where people write in an answer to the question. That is a non-standardized information. Disadvantage of non-standardized information, it is harder to make your form smarter because then you are not evaluating your answers and triggering conditions. What you're doing is you're triggering conditions based on the fact that there is an answer. There's a difference between there is an answer than a specific answer because what you need in today's world is a specific answer because we don't have time to evaluate a non-standard answer. Sometimes, yeah, I get it, but here's the thing. Sometimes it's, there is no option but to do that, and that's fine. But for most part, if we sit and we evaluate our own processes that we currently follow, we can redo our processes very easily and create a standardized data set. It's not the easiest challenge to do. It is hard, but it can be done. And a smart form, like I said, once you have it, it is very useful because it's a maintenance mode once you create it. Creating is the, is the toughest part. And then you can just go ahead and use that, and it makes your work life so much easier. So now that we've collected uh, this all this data and using a smart form, move these things around so it's like you don't collect a whole lot of data, but it's relevant data. What do we do with it? Like, how do we get this data to actually be evaluated? It, it just can't, you just can't have the data flow in a linear fashion, right? Because, like I said, today, we don't have the time to actually go and wait for things to happen. We, things move really quickly. Things change. Landscapes shift, you know, really quickly. So what do you do? You need, so right now, a lot of approvals actually flow in a linear fashion. Now, it could be, when I say linear, it could be a straight line or it could be in a, you know, in a way where it just holds and waits for other people before it can move forward. Um, we've seen this time and time again. Uh, creates a lot of bottleneck, it creates a lot of backlog, and there isn't an easy way to move forward but to wait. Like, and if it is associated with a stringent uh, process, you kind of end up getting stuck. And a lot of times, 
since it's it's sort of linear, everything is evaluated. Everything is thrown in there, and you are just looking at it, and you have no idea what's going on because you're just reading uh, on information. So how do you get around this? Again, I'm going to keep using the word smart, and smart workflow, you create a smart workflow. Very similar to what we talked about in the forms. The idea is to create uh, things to be consistent. Uh, so you have your workflow or you have your forms, which is smart. Your form fields are your keys. The information that you capture also not only drives your form, but also drives your uh, workflow. Because your, like I said, data is the key. Your, without the data, none of this is of any value. So you have your smart workflow, and based on based on your questions that you answer or your triggers, your workflow can move down different pathways, or your SMEs or your experts can be can be sent applic send notifications at the same time so they can actually go in and they can work on their step independent of waiting on anybody. So you take out the linear, you can go into parallel mode. You you could have your linear if you want to, if it's a shorter workflow. You could go into parallel mode. You could go into, um, you could use decisions based on your questions and you can have your workflow make decisions, reset business rule. You can have your entire business rule written up in the workflow where it can go down different direction. And what are the, what are the advan advantages of that? Like I said, you, not everybody needs to sit and wait for the other person they evaluate. And you can streamline your process. It also cuts out noise for the evaluator because now your evaluator is not looking at information which is uh, complex. Uh, they're just looking at information that is relevant to the organization. They are looking at information which gives them the most informed decision. Uh, let them make the most informed decision. They are looking at, so they're looking at, um, they're looking at these, so when they're looking at the workflow, they can actually see how the data is flowing. So if you look at the example uh, in, um, in the picture, it starts off with a request and goes to safety. After safety, based on the information on the safety uh, uh, step, it actually makes a decision if the workflow needs to be sent to through IH or EHNS or to both of them. Or it just needs to bypass them and go to product stewardship. And, and you think, if, if you have that, it's so much easier because now you don't have, let's say this workflow has to go directly to product stewardship, you don't have your IH and EHNS people involved in it because they, now they are not wasting time looking at the information saying, you know, just, just approving it blindly because they, it's not applicable to them. They're not involved. They, they are focusing on other tasks. When product stewardship just needs to approve, evolve, I mean, approve it, and the product gets moved on to the end, end step. Now, here's the thing. Here's one of the things what I've noticed is people tend to throw in a lot of what-if scenarios and they move um, the workflow through different pathways. Let's not do that. It It is complex. I know when, when we say smart workflow and if you have something like this, we tend to create every possible what-if scenarios and what-if pathways, what-if forms, and we try to move the workflow through those scenarios and try and approve them. Like, I, I'll give you an example. So you, if you've heard of ICD codes, you, you know that they are used uh, by your doctor's office to, you know, put your diagnosis down so that your insurance company can uh, review, fill out the claim. There is an ICD code uh, which actually says, hmm, repeat, I mean, it says, sub through a jet engine, repeat encounter. What are the odds? I mean, I'm gonna leave it up to you guys to think is, what are the odds of that actually happening twice? So somebody out there created a code thinking, what if this happened twice? And now that's never gonna happen. But then you, if, you, if you think of all these what-if scenarios and you create your redundant workflow, you, you can make your smart workflow absolutely useless. 
So when you're creating these smart workflows and you're actually creating um, those your smart forms, make sure you are completely aware of what your process is and what you need and what are you trying to solve with that. You're approving a chemical. At the end of the day, it's still approving a chemical. That's the underlying goal. But why are you approving the chemical? What is the purpose? That is what you need to solve. And to solve that, you need to collect. This is the data that you need to collect and how it should move. That is the key for using your smart workflow and your smart forms. So why, so, so let's talk about each of the steps that the workflow has to go through, right? So I'm, like, like I said, I'm gonna keep this generic because of the simple fact. I don't, I'm not able to define what each step uh, should be because like I said, each organization is unique. They have unique needs, they have unique demands. They are in different industries. They're subject to different, different legal implications. They're subject to different uh, regulatory information. Now, each step that you have within the workflow where you have an evaluator now, just remember, we are making the assumption you already have a smart form, you already have a smart workflow. We have that, we have made that assumption, and now we have to think about what information we need to capture in each step. Each step has, has an evaluator, and that evaluator needs to add information to this because they are experts. They need to look at what was requested, they need to go and look at regulatory information, and they can, they, and legal implications, they need to know all the technical uh, information and add to that information. And this keeps, this information is ad, added on to, e on each step till the material is approved. A lot of time, like I said, we talked about, I gave you the example of the ICD code, um, of other, being sucked to the jet engine. This is where people forget and they have a lot of redundancy and what ifs. So you have to ask that each step that you have, each evaluator you have in your smart workflow, is it saving you time? Is it, or is it causing a potential bottleneck? Because the, at the end of the day, the, the purpose of a smart workflow is to help you. It's supposed to make your life easier. It's supposed to give you relevant information. It is, it is supposed to take out the potential bottleneck. It is supposed to move through a pathways of least resistance, yet at the same time captures the most amount of information. The impact to the step, so when we talk about the impact, we are talking about what is the impact to your business? What is the impact to your process. What is the impact to your end product? That is what we um, need. That is what you need to understand, and that is what you need to consider when you build out your steps or you evaluate your steps for your smart workflow. Because you could have, you could have your initial forms and everything set up for awesome, but if you don't set it up your step, it can impact your step and can impact your end uh, result. So why would we want to do this? So the reason we would want to do this is because of you know, we, a lot of changes, a lot of things, but the key things that we found is when you're, create, when you're creating a new product or when you're changing your product and you're changing your ingredient, that's when you have to have more control in each step. But again, these, these, are, these three things can have a lot of impact, a downstream impact on your end users, your workers, your, your employees, uh, environment, legal, transportation, and it could change your entire product that could affect your product stewardship goals for the year or for your business. So you need to, you need to have control on each step of the way. Smart workflows let you control uh, each, each step of the way, but you need to ask those relevant questions before you actually make that decision. All right, so let's talk about some of the best 
practices. It's sort of like a review of what we just went through. Uh, the best practices uh, for both workflow is standardized option. This is more applies to the form. Standardized, like like use checkboxes, use drop downs, um, use radio buttons. You you eliminate. You try and eliminate questions where the user has to enter a lot of data in terms of brief answers or a text box because you end up with non-standard in information. If you collect information as standardized option, A, it's super easy to report on. You can filter easily. If you take that data out and you put it in another reporting application, you have more control over what, what you're reporting. What, but why do that? What, what's the advantage of reporting, right? Simple thing is, like I said, we, have your, we go back to your green chemistry, you go back to your product stewardship. You want to make changes to your product. You want to make changes uh, to your process. You still need to know information about the chemical that is coming on board. You need to know how, what, how they are being used. Do you really need to change something? There, there are a lot of business questions that come up, and, it all, and that the impact of that is supported by your reports. You need to, that standard information lets you create those reports, and it's easy for somebody who's not technical to actually read and evaluate uh, the report. It eliminates confusion for your users and your uh, SMEs, so they no longer have to worry about, oh, why is this answer written this way, or why is the text, what does this text mean? They know exactly what they're looking at. They're looking at the key information. It's standard, and they go, yep, I know exactly what this uh, person wants this material for, and I know exactly where it's going. I know who's, who's going to get impacted, and here's the additional information that I can give the requester regarding what they want to do. Um, with that chemical. And we already talked about simplifying report. I kind of covered that in standardized option. Streamline login. Um, this, is, this is not directly uh, related to chemical approval, but it's more related to audit grade. So you've got to streamline login in the sense your users, a lot of your users, when they are asking for material, they do it on a shop floor. Uh, what we like to call shop floor, like, you know, process area, things like that. So they don't have time to always log in to your application because they are more focused on the process. So streamline login would let them easily access that information, but it will also, it will also let you guys know who's been requesting, who's from which department a lot of information come, uh, requests are coming, because I think that's kind of key to keep track of because that helps you know how your chemicals are being brought on site and who's bringing them, what are they being used for, does that information relate to something that you need to change? It could, because you could actually have that information and uh, you could go, oh, I have this process area asking for more chemicals, why is that? Let's evaluate their process, what they're doing, can we give them an alter alternative uh, chemical or do we move them towards something else? So those, those are some of the things you can answer using that information. Okay, so we do have another poll that we wanted you guys to take. Um, so it's how long does your current approval process uh, take? Is it minutes? Is it hours? Is it days? Is it weeks? Is it months? Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, recently, we were having conversations with some of our um, customers, and then there were there were customers who were telling us like, "Hey, we we approve things in in minutes," and then there were other people who were actually telling us like, "Hey, I I still have things in my queue for like from like a year ago, or I have a queue I have something in my queue six month from six months ago." And so we asked them like, "So why you have, why do you have something which is waiting on like for six months?" The answer we got was, hey, so they have to go and ask information to, for they kind of get information from a manufacturer. And I was like, so why was why aren't you using something which is smart workflow, which sends an email to a manufacturer and kind of you know follows up with them, and well, then have then have one of those uh, workflow uh, systems. But it it was it was eye opening to know that you know things queued up for months and weeks, and it just stayed there. All right, so we've had, all right, so we have the results of, of the poll, about 46% of you guys said within days, and that's a good sign. 
Um, where a smarter workflow can actually reduce the number of days uh, that you that you have, um, you know, pending for your work, uh, for your approval. So yeah, that that's always a good thing. All right. So let's talk about some of the other data sources. So we talked about data from SDS. We talked talked about data from you know your in your your evaluators, your man, manufacturer suppliers, or other data sources. But we never really talked about regulation. We did talk. I did touch upon. A, we have to keep in focus on what the regulation, uh, what, what the impact of regulation is to your industry. So let's talk about um, the regulation data. Everybody is subject to regulation. Every industry is. We need to actually look. Uh, you need to look out the chemical that you're bringing on board. How it impacts. Um, or how does it impact your regulation? How do you in, incorporate that information in a smart workflow? You don't, right now, I'm sure we go manually go look it up, but the idea is to leverage that information in your smart workflow. So there's, then, there's a need for automated cross-referencing of data. You have your CAS numbers. You need your CAS numbers to be cross-referenced against the material that, is, that you're bringing on board. You need that information to automatically show up in your smart workflow, smart form, so you can leverage that information to drive the direction of your evaluation. It is, it is key. And here's the thing, when we talk about regulation, we, we, are, we are not talking about regulation which has, just has direct impact. There's downstream impact that you need to worry about. Uh, advantages, you have more information, more power to you to make an informed decision. Um, and you can cross reference this cross reference data can be used to drive your product storage, can drive your safety. It, it lets you look at uh, alternative uh, material, looks at to help you promote your green chemistry. You can have a cross reference and you know your material has a certain amount of corrosiveness. It's not enough to, in your industry, to have an impact, but then the same material when you're trying to sell to another country, another continent, it could be a different ball game. But you know your data, so when you cross-reference, you can get different reference information, and you can use that to promote your, uh, find an alternative. So, so what, is, what is the result of all of this, having a smart workflow, smart chemical, uh, smart forms, and cross-referencing? At the end of the day, all that data needs to be filtered. It needs to be completely, it doesn't need, you don't need 100 data points to make a decision. You need, let's say, I don't know, I mean, from a process standpoint, let's say previously you were uh, capturing 100 data points. Now you just possibly need to capture only 20 because you created a workflow which replicates what your business, ideal business process is. You can, push through that information, you can ask for that relevant information, you can get that relevant cross-reference information. And at the end, you just see the key information and you make your decision. So this drives, like I said, this drives your current process, it drives your future processes, it drives your product stewardship, it gives you information, it protects your employees, protects your customers, it makes you more efficient, streamlined, saves you time, money, and it reduces a whole lot of your um, risks. And risk management at the end is key as, and is very important as much as it is for just approve, having a really good chemical inventory cracking or chemical knowledge base of what's on site. Okay, so let's, let's quickly touch upon uh, threshold reporting and inventory, because I started talking about inventory. Um, like I said, we have a lot of chemicals on site. There's a lot of quantity data that is available. We need that data to be reported, and it has to be tied to each of your requests. So when you have all these chemicals on site, why were they brought? What, what, did they, what was the quantity that was brought on board? You capture all of that in your approval process, and you can actually create a report based on that. And that report could be used for uh, reporting to regulatory bodies over across 
all the more where it requires you to report quantities. You could, the same thing based on quantities can be, you're cross-referencing against regulation and they, they can be flagged. They can be flagged for your evaluators to know, hey, you're over-ordering or you're at risk. So these are some of the, some of the things which you can actually kickstart from your chemical approval data. Now, I don't want to go into too much into detail because these two topics on their own are huge and, and they have their own complex data set that needs to be uh, reviewed or the process. But your chemical approval data could be triggers for flags or information and, and which requires you some kind of monitoring for quantity data and cross reference data. All right, so, so what's the, so let's look at the big picture or, or what we call as a, you know, an over, overview or a summary of what, what we just went through. Why do we need this um, logical chemical approval process? You know, basically what it does is it fulfills your business need. And when we say, when I say it fulfills your business need, it matches your business process. You can control your business process in your chemical uh, approval process and you have your chemical come through exactly the way through the right evaluator into your uh, facility. Reduce, you reduce your risk, it, you keep it, um, you keep a limit, you keep track of what's coming on board, you meet all your regulatory obligations, you you can adapt to a changing regulatory obligation. And like we said, the implementation of a dynamic, flexible process that makes it so much easier. You, again, the wrong person does not have to review. Wrong person, uh, the person who needs, who need not look at certain things, don't, they don't have to. It's so much easier to control how the data flows, who needs to see, what do they need to see, why do they need to see that and you can all cover that in a smart workflow. And smart workflow, again, like it's, uh, can be integrated with other processes where you have threshold reporting and inventory, um, and you can even in include that with purchasing where you look at data and based on that you can trigger things. So at this time I will leave it up to any questions that we have. Okay, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, looks like we have a little less than 15 minutes for questions. Just a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Uh, we do have a couple waiting. Um, can, the first question, Abhishek, can you talk me through an example of a smart chemical approval, something like a use case? Okay, so, okay, so, so let's say I was talking about sodium bicarbonate. Let's just go back to the example that I was using um, in the presentation. Let's say you're getting sodium bicarbonate onto your, uh, uh, into your facility. So what will happen is now you have a medical department in your organization and you have a lab. A chemical like sodium bicarbonate is used as, you know, it can be consumed uh, orally. It can be used as um, a filler in our medicine, like it can use as a, it's used as a vehicle. But in a, in a lab, you need to know what is the safe, safety, like what happens when you spill chemical bicarbonate, how do you, or what is the flash point, what is the boiling point, and things like that. You, do, you don't need that information for the medical team. You need that information for your lab. So the, now you see it's the same material, but you need different sets of information. So why create one giant workflow where everybody has to review or, or answer questions, which is generic. Like you have to capture all the information in one form and it goes through a linear thing, a linear process. With a smart workflow, you could set it up. So based on triggers, where you say the trigger is, hey, I want to use this in my medical facility, it opens up a set of questions. And in the workflow, it actually goes to the, the medical professional who needs to evaluate. You, I'm sure as an organization, you have your environmental health and safety or safety person, but then you don't need the, the lab supervisor to review this material. What you need is you need your medical team. So this workflow then goes down to the medical team and 
they evaluate it and then they approve it for their medical facility because that sodium bicarbonate is not going to the laboratory, it's going to the medical facility. And that's why you use, that's one of the use cases of a smart workflow, uh, rather an example. But think about it, that's, that's what we mean. It's like you have chemicals coming in for different facilities at different times. And why, why make them go through this whole gigantic information gathering when it can be specific and they can be directed to the right people with, you know, the right kind of information? Okay, thanks. Uh, second question, how, how do I know who to incorporate into the approval? All right, so, 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 to, answer, so to, to answer this question is, every organization has a business process. It has, and this is something which has to be evaluated at an organization level. So you could, you, for example, you could have a process where if a material is come, supposed to be brought on site, it needs to be looked at, let's say, eh and IEH, uh, environmental and and once they approve it can be brought on site now that's a process right so you so you know these are the uh, three people three groups that needs to be looking at this and and when I say three groups doesn't have to be like a whole lot of people it could be one person uh, who does two of the roles and there's one person who does the th uh, third role so but that's a process you draw out the process and you basically say, okay, so who needs to review first? Does somebody's decision override the others? Or, or do all three of them have to approve? Or if one of them approves and the other two don't, it can still be approved. I mean, that, that process is defined by each organization. And once you know that process, once you figure that out, like what, how, you, how do you do that? Or who needs to evaluate? You can create your... Uh, smart workflow and process based on that. Now, it does it does not just stop at who needs to evaluate. You also need to look at why do you need to evaluate that? What regulation get, that does it get impacted by? What are the legal implications? Who do we have to report to? Is there anybody outside this group? Does somebody from corporate needs to look? Why and who? So you need to figure out all of that information and and that kind of defines your workflow or a process. And then you can then create a smart one or you can just have a linear one that's, that's on you know, how the process is set up. Okay. Um, how do you get other people to buy in to the, the approval system? Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting uh, question. It, 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 it is a company culture, but you also see the impact. You you see there are certain key data points wherein you see uh, when you have people trying to approve outside the process, they end up uh, waiting much longer trying to get something approved. It's like when you don't have a process, it's stuck at a certain person's desk or they are, they are out on vacation and suddenly you are waiting on an approval. So your your daily work is stuck because somebody couldn't approve a chemical. Or when you don't have a process where people haven't evaluated, you randomly go and buy an, uh, a material off the shelf, which you think you've been using in your organization, and suddenly an incident happens, and then your data is incorrect, and then you en end up in a uh, legal situation. You end up in a lawsuit. It costs you money. Or you get inspected by OSHA. Walks in, STS does not match uh, the chemicals, and you see yourself in a fine situation where you're being fined. So, in examples like that should be enough um, for somebody to buy in. But the other, the most important thing is for them, they don't have to worry about things. The workflow send them notification. They need to go evaluate all the key relevant information there. They need to approve or deny. I mean, for them, the life becomes easier. It's streamlined. There, there is no, there's no reason why they need to work on, you know, worry about things. It takes away the risk. Okay. Uh, thanks, Abhishek. I have a, a question here. Actually. Um, uh, three-part question from uh, Mimi. 
Um, I'm going to read the whole thing to you, and then I might have to read it back to you because there's a lot of information here. But um, she says, how do you integrate the approval process with the procurement process? She says, our procurement process utilizes a procurement card and PRPO, which operate differently. Is the approval done before entering the procurement process? And if so, how do you have the two processes communicate with each other to ensure that only approved items are purchased? Okay, so yeah, this is a very common question that we've, we've heard in the industry. Um, so your approval, according to, I mean, I, I would say um, the way it should, should work is your approval process uh, should start before your procurement. So you start your approval process. And the reason I say approval has to start before uh, procurement is because a material may not get approved. So why even trigger your procurement process for a material that will not get approved? Um, so you start your approval process. Once the material is approved, that's when you trigger your uh, procurement process. Now, if you have and this is very common where your approval system and your procurement systems are independent. You and the smart workflow and the smart um, forms, they actually, you could use an API. It, it, so you have an API where once your approval has happened on your workflow, you take your key relevant data points and the API pulls that information and sends it to the procurement system. So your procurement actually knows that, hey, this material is approved. Here are the key relevant information that I need to know. And then your procurement person can actually generate, uh, I don't know, I mean, let's say a unique identifier in the procurement system and send it back while they do their thing. Or they could actually hold on till they actually have the procurement process completed on their system. And once that is done, they can send that information back to the smart workflow. And so when the smart workflow finally goes to the, uh, the final approval state and the record is stored in your application, you actually have your procurement information right there with the uh, material information. So anytime you reorder something, it can, it, it can go through a faster evaluation and, if, and then you, again, then you can just go back to your procurement wait till procurement finishes and you have the second record of procurement with the chemical information. So, so when your, your chemical use people on your shop floor or your managers, when they're looking at it, they don't have to now go and look at procurement, but they have all that information. Okay, thanks Abhishek. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, my thanks to Abhishek Roy for his presentation, to Sphira for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants Please keep an eye on AIHA.webvent.tv for future Synergist webinars, and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at AIHA.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link, and please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.